Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Pankesh is doing pretty well, right? With uh, oh, Pankesh started all, guys. all of us on uh, really time. Yes, yes. So. All right. Uh, uh, so we are just taking a uh, uh, look at all the people. Okay, we are recording. Good. Oh, we can get started then. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I'll uh, share screen and see um, if it, everything is in place. Hemant, I have given you right to share a screen. I think you can share the screen now. It's, Hemant? it's slowly okay. loading. Sorry, Pandey, it's just my system a little slow. Um, Wonderful. So if you can see my screen now. It actually shows here that it uh, has started sharing. Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So, hello everyone. Thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, thanks to Dr. Shet, my wonderful PhD advisor and uh, my great colleague Pankesh. Uh, thanks for the introduction there. Uh, and uh, as Pankesh mentioned, I'm from George Mason University in Baljuna School of Engineering um, and professor in the Department of Information Sciences and Technology and leading this humanity and informatics lab. And uh, my focus area is in human, uh, human centered computing. Let me just get read of this um, just a sec. It doesn't come. Then I read the panel. We are able to see it fine. Uh, I floating. Uh, I'm trying to actually get read of this floating panel so that nothing comes. Um, oh, okay. is, is everything visible? I've got one extra. Um, uh, Pankesh, can you see everything fine? Slight transitioning and all. Yes, okay. I can see. I can see the screen well. Perfect, perfect. So I just want to get read of those controls. Yeah, so, far, so far, as your full screen, everything will be fine. Yes, Richard. so that is it. I didn't want to see those floating controls. So um, yeah, you can give me prompt. I'll try to uh, keep it um, within an hour. And after that, we can have some Q&A as well. Um, if any students have any questions or want to uh, you know, further discuss you know, different directions. So we'd be happy to discuss those as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll start with um, the idea of this human AI collaboration and uh, um, what broad research area this you know lies in uh, that we are investigating and seeing its value for um, uh, social media process and data processing uh, in real time for city services and then that's where we discuss uh, two research problems which basically are well connected to uh, this kind of uh, user inspired research scenarios and then we discuss the future direction. So my broad research area is in human centered computing. And what is human-centered computing? So this is an area which basically explore the idea of integrating human sciences, your social sciences, your cognitive sciences, your humanities. So that side of the world, which is non-technical to the side of technical world where we study all computer science method as you guys would have been studying in your different classes, machine learning, data mining, statistical approaches and so on. Uh, and we use this to design computing systems with a human focus, right? Which should consider the personal, social, and cultural context. Yes, we can do the shift operation better. But, uh, Excuse yeah, me, but, uh, is there any question or? Okay, yeah, I, I will proceed. Um, yeah, please feel free to interrupt for any questions if you have any. I heard some noise, so that's why I, I, I just stopped for a moment. So yeah, we designed this kind of computing systems which are considering this uh, personal, social, and cultural context into account for the human side, right? And my focus has been on social media mining and semantic text analytics approaches for uh, this real-time uh, data processing systems at uh, city services. Um, and I'll give example what kind of city services my uh, research lab's thrust has been um, in different uh, three major directions for different different problems, starting on mitigating and responding to this natural crisis. Uh, so how do we improve crisis communication of the, uh, our city services, for instance, by mining actionable posts and by mining uh, approach, basically information uh, that allows them to better uh, make the strategies for communicating to public and respond better. Uh, we've also worked on societal crisis that how do you model human behavior 
on um, online spaces where there are these harmful behaviors are um, also that people are uh, you know, expressing and how do you mind that to model better um, you know, understanding of um, the stereotypical or hate, uh, hateful behaviors and how we can actually use that to inform policymakers and also assess the policies um, and laws that are out there. And third has been the area where we have uh, looked at kind of flip side approach of um, information processing um, that will just the way in um, our typical information processing world for real-time systems, we are interested in reducing the information overload on the human actors, right? But in a cyber defense scenario, we want to reverse this approach that rather we want to create and induce uh, information overload on cyber attackers. So uh, this has been also a line of work uh, that we have done in the past. Uh, so I would focus primarily for our today's uh, lecture on natural crisis that how we can actually use the human-centered computing approaches for natural disaster uh, settings. And where basically we can support city services for that. So if you look at traditional work at emergency uh, management services, you have a world event happening, and then there is a data collection mechanism, such as like you would call 911, right? And there will be a human actor who would be basically uh, understanding the information, uh, what information is provided, and then, you know, go from there for response and dispatch and uh, so on. So in this uh, setup of a traditional mechanism of uh, emergency management services, uh, what has started happening is that the there are new ways. Uh, some of these, you know, uh, services which are there, uh, you know, to collect this data and then you know do the uh, response generally in our cities or in our communities. The um, the number of uh, human workers that we have they're pretty limited, you know. So we have a limited human resources. And what happens during the times of large scale disasters is that many of the services get. Uh, overwhelmed, right? And they, they go out of capacity. And because of that, um, people in general, because they want to seek help, they move on to the platforms of social media and they start asking help uh, and they start sharing messages over there. Uh, and because of this kind of a situation, uh, increasingly the services that we have in our cities, uh, they're moving towards um, also going in the direction of monitoring and uh, looking at the data that's coming from these. Uh, uh, other alternative communication platforms such as social media. Uh, and because of all of those, uh, we can extrapolate uh, you know, those uh, different alternative communication mechanisms, but I'll stick to um, the popular social media uh, platforms like Twitter and Facebook for a moment. So if you look at like people are sharing information from those platforms and you can imagine how many number of uh, Posts are in fact there within a minute on this kind of platforms, right? So clearly, these type of alternative communication mechanisms can overwhelm this emergency management services, right? So therefore, um, in the future, uh, the these type of services would not be just uh, uh, you know uh, managed with the help of human workers, but also with the help of AI agents who would be assisting those human workers in managing. Uh, this, you know, information overload that has been, you know, um, induced because of all the data that's coming from this alternative communication platforms. So um, then question comes is that while you start bringing these kinds of AI based systems, right, uh, but how do you really improve the AI mental model, whatever the uh, specific, uh, you know, model that you are using, and have its understanding similar to a worker's mental model, right? A human worker's mental model. And because there are a lot of preferences and priorities um, that may go into place in making decisions um, when a request for help comes in, how does it manage, right? And so to really address that, uh, we can go deeper into understanding then how do we design these type of AI systems, right? Which would be working to assist these human workers um, in, uh, if we want to design the systems, we want to make them grounded in the fundamental information processing task, right? So they want to, um, so human workers want to use the systems to filter content, right? Because there's so much content that's uh, being generated uh, and being shared and being sent to these services on the social media platforms. So you have first problem of filtering where you have classification problem. Then you have a second problem, uh, which is about prioritization as well. That if I have, let's say uh, some uh, hundred requests, right? 
whom do I prioritize? So there also uh, a rule of decision making that generally human actors would uh, um, employ some kind of uh, you know mechanism. There would be some kind of tested knowledge they would have. How do we make our uh, AI agent also understand that? Right. So we can look at uh, we cannot create a perfect model, of course, right? Because as the you know the behaviors of people's expression of seeking help and things of this nature change on the social media platforms from one disaster to another disaster and so on. So what we can do is we can create adaptive mechanisms, you know, that these models can be adaptive in nature. So one problem therefore is that how do we adapt our models to classify relevant items in a data stream? Second is, if we create a ranking mechanism, right, that uh, let's say a specific ranking algorithm like your Google search gives you like top 10 results to look at and so on, right? But those top 10 results that uh, uh, your Google gives, you may not have time to look at all those top 10 results, right? So in the same way here, a uh, human worker may not have sufficient time to look at all the 10 messages. And we are just trivializing here by just, you know, 10 messages, you can see that in a typical disaster setting when so much millions of you know, messages are posted on the social media spaces, we'll be talking about um, at least hundreds to thousands of messages that would be uh, coming in uh, or coming across these kinds of services, right? So therefore, understanding also that how to adapt to rank these uh, you know, top key items for the human actors, you know, that also becomes an important a second problem here. So for addressing the uh, you know, whole adaptation of model aspect, we can rely on active learning, right? So in, in the AI world, we have this active learning system where people are uh, having this adaptation of the model over time. One problem with this active learning is that uh, active learning takes feedback from humans, right? But what about the reliability of the annotator or the person who's giving feedback to, to this model, right? So that is one um, area of uh, the research issues we can say that one needs to address. And the second there, in the second problem where we have to create this uh, ranking mechanisms which are adaptive in nature, we have to factor in the human workload uh, and how do we do that as well, right? So that also becomes a uh, typical research issue here. So for the first problem, that how do we model those human errors when we have these kinds of active learning systems deployed in, in the uh, you know, real world settings, right? And the alternative name for that is this human in the loop AI system, right? So you have this humans in the loop where, who are basically giving feedback to your active learning uh, model that you have uh, for you know, filtering or relevancy classification. So um, the question is that about the annotated reliability, right? And we wonder what if basically there are systematic issues of errors you know, through which you know uh, the annotated reliability is being affected whenever the human actor is giving feedback to active learning models. So to address that, we need to understand like what are potential error causes, right? And one way to look at that is relying on the signs of humans and human behavior. Right, and that's where psychology theories come into play. So a lot of research has gone into uh, psychology world or psychology discipline and literature. Uh, uh, can I interrupt? Sorry. Um, uh, yeah. What is the nature of um, input that the human might give to the active learning system? And so they would be giving labels. For example, if we look at the uh, message, uh, if we look at let's say uh, somebody. Uh, asking, you know, throwing these kind of messages as example uh, that you see with it uh, on social media, uh, the message on the left, for instance, uh, that 911 is not responding and there is a, a, you know, clear need for help that the person wants, right? And let's say system is not uh, detecting these kind of messages perfectly, right? And because of that, uh, you know, the it, it needs help from the human actors to continually improve the model. Right. So the human actor would give labels, basically the relevancy labels to this message, though this is a highly relevant message. So uh, if the uh, current labels on those messages are not right, you're soliciting more labels? Is that what this is? You are soliciting correct labels. Um, the labels being predicted by your existing active learning models are not correct. 
and because of that you're soliciting that's what model thinks and the way how that is determined is the confidence score right when a prediction model is employed on this stream of these messages so at every instance in this stream of messages uh, there will be question asked right that whether this uh, this message belongs to high relevancy or low relevancy and the model may not be sure right that the the if you look at the prediction probability the confidence score that is just like around 50% so model is not sure at the time right and therefore it will pick that instance or rather it will sample that instance from the uncertainty region in okay. in its uh, decision space and it will give to the human actor okay yeah. thanks okay so uh, basically in therefore in that kind of setup the potential human errors uh, that it can come out or that may be induced because of annotators burnout right that uh, person who's giving feedback may be burned out because of the amount of work that person is involved in uh, second can be cognitive bias right that uh, where a uh, human is giving the feedback uh, to the machine like the positioning of let's say a label for high relevancy versus low relevancy so answer position also creates problems and that has been studied as well uh, as a cognitive bias the third one is the human error in execution and this wasn't very much explored and this is what we had explored in our research actually that humans can actually make errors when they are actually giving these feedbacks as well and because of uh, two major type of reasons there is a theory uh, reasons theory which actually provide this uh, um, types of different human errors that may be uh, you know uh, done in specific scenarios so in psychology people have explored this in the settings of aviation um in the settings of like industrial complexes right where you have this high risk systems uh, in in place and human makes error right medical settings where human makes errors so these major categories have been studied there one is called mistakes another is called slips mistake is a situation where error is happening due to incorrect or incomplete knowledge right uh, and you may have some faulty heuristics that basically um, you have built up in in your mind right so generally in your mental model you will build understanding of the concept for which you are um, annotating the message you are giving feedback for the message right that something is high relevant because of something right and that something is what is in your mind and and basically that is not perfect right and uh, you are still learning uh, that that concept in your mind because of that you could make a uh, error of this type mistake the second type of error is slip and this happens when actually we do have a knowledge but we make error because of external context and so on and so forth so for example uh, when you have to write something on a paper right you would reach out to instead of reaching out to a pen for writing you would reach out to keyboard for typing you know so th there is a uh, that kind of uh, slip that happened that your goal was picking up the pen pen you know uh, for writing on a paper so this is these are the kinds of like uh, errors due to slip that you make errors due to slip due to contextual factors so largely for these two types of uh, you know errors there is a potential uh um, for happening in the scenarios of this active learning systems that when human is giving feedback to this active learning model uh, there may be systematic errors that of these two kinds that could be introduced and so this is what we explored in this work where our hypothesis was that the serial ordering of instances given to the human annotator uh, can co may cause him or her errors uh and errors due to mistake or slip so for example if you look at the uh, instance sequence that i'm showing you over here and this instance sequence these are all potential labels for those uh, you know instances in a sequence that let's say the first one is of class c4 the second one is of class c1 a third instance is of type c2 and so on and so forth so in this setting what happens is that when as as i was mentioning earlier that in our mind we have a model of a concept that is be continuously being constructed and you know it it's if it is already constructed then it may be insufficient for capturing the you know knowledge of the concept because concept itself has evolved in our drifting data streams so because of that you may have problems that the way the instances are given to you you may 
forget or your memory may decay over time for the understanding of those concepts. So for example, in this particular instance sequence, what can happen is this uh, uh, C3, instances that belong to class C3, you can see that in the given in, uh, sequence that I've shown you here, the, there is so much gap when, whenever the instance of class C3 appears um, after the second occurrence, right? Uh, there's a first occurrence at fourth position, there is a second occurrence at sixth position, Right, and then there is a uh, uh, next occurrence after a very long, uh, you know, uh, gap. So because of that, what can happen is person can lose, uh, you know, understanding in his memory for uh, that specific concept. So this is basically work in psychology about memory decay and forgetting behavior and so on. Uh, and uh, Abungo's curve is a he was a very famous scientist who studied this kind of behaviors that on x-axis if you see that time says first time learning happens person actually forgets the, the thing like if a person has not looked at you know and that there is a repetition is important and so you know this kind of thing has been for memory retention has been studied in educational psychology but primarily so you can use that similar idea in the world of this um, uh, human AI interaction or human AI collaboration setup. And this is where we proposed a preliminary framework to study human factors in active learning. That you can have the specific type of errors as we discussed before, like slips induced uh, uh, by certain constraints. So the, the constraints may be time constraints as well, right? That uh, you have to less time to really, um, you know, give the feedback and because of that, you know, you, um, make errors that's off type slips uh, and potential cause maybe you you forgot the concept right and so mitigation can be well you can remind uh, you know the specific instances potentially for the uh, specific concepts for which user might have forgotten the second is uh, where you have a scenario for mistakes due to serial ordering and this is what we were interested in exploring as a hypothesis as well the, in the way you have been exposed to the sequence of information, you may get actually uh, certain biases to only certain concepts and not every other concept. And because of that, you may actually not acquire the concept. Um, and basically you can, you because of that reason, um, or you may have forgotten, uh, you may still make mistakes. And third type is that you can also have a slips due to serial ordering, meaning um, you can uh, have all the presence of the concept with you, but what happens is the way you are being exposed to the sequence of instances of different uh, classes, in those different classes, you're not seeing so often a specific class, like example of C3 that we discussed. And because of that, also you can uh, make errors. So this type of uh, basically you know, psychology theory uh, based framework that we came up with to understand uh, the types of uh, potential errors that may be there uh, by human annotators when they're giving feedback to the active learning systems. And so we experimented that first with uh, uh, crowdsourcing setup to first validate that such a thing exists. And then question was how we model them, right? For the machines and test it out. So we use crowdsource, a crowdsourcing uh, experiment setup where we actually ordered 20 instances and we call them schedule basically. So what you're seeing on top is like an annotation schedule uh, on top. Um, so for you know that kind of annotation schedule, we, create, we basically ordered here 20 instances. And in this 20 instances, you can see that we intentionally placed certain instances of a certain classes, we already had you know, some ground truth label for those instances for this experiment. So we knew that which instances of which uh, class type, right? So the highlights that you see here for class C3, that's what we, we already knew the instances of class uh, type class C3. We just wanted to test out in an experimental setting that whether human makes indeed uh, these kind of errors, if there are too many gaps between the occurrence of uh, C3's instances. So in this case, we when we experimented with uh, for per uh, task, or, you know, uh, for annotating for per annotation schedule, we experimented with uh, uh, ten different human annotators, and what we got as a result was 
people did not make people made a lot of errors on first position uh, when the c3 was occurring that is like the fourth instance then they made little bit less error on the posi second position when the instance of class c3 occurred um, and that was the time uh, basically, that was a sixth instance in your annotation schedule, right? And we could see, okay, to an extent, maybe person was recently exposed to this idea, this this concept, C3, and that, that's why uh, the example of C3 was kind of understood by the human being, so he did not make error when at the sixth position, it saw the instance of C3. But at the position number three that you see, there is a lot of error that happens by the human annotators. And these are average errors across human annotators that we are talking about. And then we computed also its uh, statistical significance. We found that indeed the errors made at the position, third position, um, that is like, you know, uh, in your annotation schedule, 20th, uh, you know, instance, I can, you know, place um, or a position, you can say, as compared to the uh, position that were there at the fourth or sixth, you know, instance. So this basically gave us further motivation to uh, un basically understand and capture these kind of behaviors that yes, indeed serial ordering of the instances, the way they are given to human beings can cause systematic errors. And therefore this kind of forgetting or memory decaying behavior as psychologists have studied can also exist in this type of environments where active learning systems are being deployed and human actors are giving these annotation feedbacks. So we modeled it, um, this kind of behavior using sigmoid function. So we, we did that again, um, because we saw the pattern, like you see the sigmoid, uh, you know, functions curve. And if you see the memory decays, uh, you know, that forgetting behavior curve of uh, Ebbinghaus, you will find like similarities. And, you know, that's the reason like why we went after modeling using sigmoid function to model potential error probability uh, for a given ordered instance, right? That how, you know, uh, how many instances have passed based on uh, that, you can figure out likely probability that on a given uh, instance in your given annotation schedule, there is a likelihood of certain human errors. So we tested this out also with uh, a lab annotation testing experiment, uh, experiment with uh, three human annotators uh, where we uh, gave them 100, uh, sorry, 800 uh, ordered instances in your an annotation schedule uh, with again, like those induced errors um, at the specific positions, but we induced them with respect to like uh, using this kind of, uh, uh, you know, sigmoid function as well. And so what we noticed is that the number of correct answers that people gave in those specific, uh, you know, setting, uh, it pretty much like uh, mimic the whole idea that we wanted to capture using uh, this whole sigmoid function. That on the x-axis that you see time difference between steps of the instances of specific classes. And on the y-axis, you see the number of correct answers. So if there was too much difference between the instances of a certain class, accordingly, the number of correct answers were reduced over time as the time difference grew over time. So this, in this way, we were mathematically able to capture at least this uh, some notion of this human behavior where human makes error with the help of uh, this kind of sigmoid function. So that was basically our uh, uh, you know main uh, thrust that where the sigmoid function is uh, uh, useful to model the error probabilities. And so using that, now the solution we wanted to create here that then we want to. Uh, create annotation schedule uh, of giving the instances to the human annotator such that it augments both human performance and model performance. Because if human performance is improved in terms of making less errors, then eventually label data quality will improve and your model performance will improve. Right. So that was our solution to the overall problem uh, using the all the um, uh, frameworks that I basically described earlier and using the error modeling functions for the human error. So the process in this is that we want to generate this annotation schedules, which can actually avoid errors for the human actors. And so to do so, we basically rely upon sampling approaches. So in a sampling algorithm, uh, basically it needs to pick up like in a traditional setting, 
of uh, uncertainty uh, in, in a active learning setup. There is an uncertainty sampling. Um, that's a very popular technique that you draw decision uh, space for this data instances and you try to find out where is the uncertain region where model uh, prediction probability for instances is um, not you know, perfect, right? So, but, so we took instances basically which had probability for prediction scores for certain classes between 30% to 70%. And based on that, we, we had a candidate pool of instances. And then our next goal was that we wanted to basically both to minimize human memory decaying score and also maximize the streaming model performance. So those were our then two goals for human performance and basically the model performance. So what we did was when we sampled the instances in the first step, that okay, these are the most likely instances where model is not uh, uh, you know sure about what its uh, class should be, and therefore it needs to ask an oracle or a human actor for label. So for that, what we did was we maintained a class label, that uh, what potential class label um, of an instance we should discard at this given uh, time point, because a user may already have enough knowledge, right, enough understanding of that given concept class in his mind already. So that is what we were trying to capture. And we wanted to avoid these type of samples. Uh, and that's what we call it C discarded class. And how do we choose that C discarded class was based on uh, this question, uh, based on this assumption that if the class is appearing too frequent and if the class is adding noise to the streaming model. So uh, I think here there is one question. Please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask that. So I have a question on this this first point, which is uh, you ask a um, relabeling of the instance based on the decision boundary, how close it is to the decision boundary. At what stage do you do that? Like um, if you wait until the whole training process is over, it could be forever. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we do that at uh, every basically instance stage. So uh, you can see like uh, in this figure over here, uh, the the there is a stream of instances like this dot 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 that's being represented here like this okay and uh, uh, at let's say time point t i minus when you had let's say uh, certain instances based on which you constructed them you took the feedback from the user and then you built the model okay and then what you do is uh, so you uh, by the way you keep for testing the model performance using a test set which is fixed right so at time point t i let's say if I have to use a model, so I will use the model that has been constructed with the help of whatever instance uh, that was annotated at previous timestamp, that is the I minus one, and the uh, existing other training sets that we had beforehand. So using that, let's say at time TI, I have a model. And then based on that, what, I, what we construct is, we basically get a uh, for the new instances that have come up between, let's say, the I minus one to TI. So for those instances, uh, we have basically this check um, that we saw in the previous uh, slide that we will check with the model that whether these instances are uh, going to be of a certain class. And based on, let's say, the different shapes over here, circle or triangle or so on, uh, these are basically denoting, let's say, different types of classes, C1, C2, C3, and C4 all. And so from here, from this uh, potential candidate um, you know, instances, we are able to predict uh, using our current model, uh, what potential class they would belong to. And based on that, we are able to discard some of those instances that which instance basically we can discard based on our understanding of, of what is our current C uh, discarded is, which means which is a specific class that we need to discard currently. Based on that, you sample the specific instance that, okay, we could consider um, in instance of uh, uh, class, let's say it is a C3 and C4, I think those instances uh, potentially would be okay. And, you know, but you are not sure though, right? Uh, you're still just guessing all this until you give to the human er uh, annotator and then human annotator can actually annotate the instances, those specific potential instances, which model thinks that likely will not cause uh, further uh, memory decay in the human's mind. 
And so based on that, you know, you, you're, you're basically this process just keep continuing. So you have a new annotated, in, uh, you know, instances, and then based on that, your model gets again revised and you at the time point TI plus one, you repeat the same story that whatever instances were between TI and TI plus one, you're going to use those as a candidate instances. Uh, okay. so, uh, I mean, that is a great answer, but uh, bet the, uh, between TI minus one and TI and then TI and TI plus one, mm -hmm. is the, uh, uh, have you done any analysis of statistical convergence? Like if say you're using stochastic gradient, uh, then between TI minus one and TI, there's no reason you should believe that's a good point to ask a question because we don't know if it's reached the optimum. Or between TI and TI plus one, there's no reason to believe that unless between all these eyes, uh, you have seen sort of similar rates of learning. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's how you construct. So the error matrix actually does that, right? That's what it captures. That's how you determine what should be your, this, uh, you know, C discarded should be. So what we take assumption here is the following, that if I consider, uh, let's say class C1, uh, instance for annotation uh, and then model let's say model gets created uh, with the inclusion of the instance that has been uh, just labeled with the uh, class uh, instance of class c1 because of condition on the c1 what are the errors model errors that are going to happen to the other classes which are c2 c3 and c4 that's how we get a sense of that whether uh, you know, a specific, uh, you know, class should be considered as a C discarded or not. So to your point that whether, you know, uh, the model, the what will be the models at a rate, right? We, uh, what, that's what we are essentially trying to capture in the way that what models error are for per class, right? Because generally, as, as we know, typically these models will try to bias themselves to the, uh, the majority class instances, right? as much as for minority class instances. And so therefore it is equally important that minority class instances are also given weight. And that's what we are trying to kind of uh, capture here, that we want, to, uh, we want to be fair to all the classes. Okay. All right. So we basically did then this kind of experiment where we were using these sampling algorithm uh, in the way uh, that basically this er the human errors could be mitigated uh, as compared to like other, uh, you know, uh, uh, sampling algorithm, which could be possible. So here are like the three kinds of settings from left to right that uh, the left is like where the humans forget very fast, right? Uh, so there's a fast forgetting setting that uh, the uh, the humans are going to make like you know, lots of errors because they're forgetting like a lot of these concepts now and then second setting is like slow forgetting where humans are uh, forgetting but at a slower rate and then basically you have a no forgetting uh, setting that is basically completely on the right hand side so on the left hand side graph uh, that you see here that there are these three uh, random sampling, uncertainty sampling, and then you have an error mitigating sampling. And what we observed is that over time, the model's performance actually over time improved when the samples were being uh, selected with the help of this error mitigation sampling algorithm. And this we actually, because we had some ground truth uh, annotated data, so we kind of did this in a simulated experimental setting. So th that's how this uh, results are you know, based on. Uh, so we used used basically all the three types of algorithm on a, a sequence of instances for which we already had a ground truth uh, labels available. And so that's how we kind of uh, did this experiment to uh, get those results. And so generally in majority of the cases that you can see over time that we start to see good performance for this error mitigate, mitigating uh, sampling approach as compared to like the approach, which is what uh, conventional active learnings uncertainty sampling is, right? Or uh, a naive approach of just like a random sampling. So this was basically like a, a, a solution to a problem where we wanted to improve that. How can you then uh, improve the performance of the model over time uh, by modeling the types of human errors which uh, could be possible and then trying to mitigate them. Uh, 
um, using a, a predictive approach that potentially human is likely going to make error if this specific class instance is provided to the human. So um, we did uh, that kind of uh, uh, solution to this problem. And then we moved on to the second problem here. That is that if I have a, uh, I use basically this uh, in uh, models for ranking. I have done like uh, first problem was centered around like this relevancy classification and all. But second problem is centered around if I have this kind of ranking uh, that is being provided to the uh, these human workers that basically gives them, okay, here are the top K instances that uh, um, you can look at, which are basically the alerts or we can say the uh, top call for uh, help messages. Uh, but in this scenario, if model does not understand that what are the potential uh, human factors that are involved in who is the user of this kind of ranking system, it's not going to be efficient again in terms of helping the user, right? So then how do we kind of increase the human control or agency when you are providing, let's say, this uh, X number or K number of instances, the ranked instances for the human user to look at? So a typical approach can be you can rank these instances using time-based, credibility-based, um, some relevancy-based ranking, right? And in that only, this notion of serviceability comes into picture. So we proposed a model which basically captures the serviceability in a prior work to the specific work that we did. And our goal was that whichever kind of ranking mechanism that you provide, um, that ranking mechanism infused in this kind of ranking system for the, uh, the service personnel, well, can we increase the agency and control for this um, human user in the services? So the, uh, the problem then basically can be uh, then formed around in, in the setting as how many and how often do you generate these uh, request alerts for a response from a human servicer? right because uh, any request that you would provide to the human services to uh, look at it's going to cause him some workload right so he has to cognitively apply some understanding of what that request and accordingly uh, just may take a action for response so uh, again from a design point of view for such a system then the question would be that um, well i have one metric which can be machine or system centric that i can aim for getting uh, as many you know messages as possible, so I can basically not uh, I would not lose let's say uh, important messages, right? But if I have a high recall setting, uh, I'm also creating more work for the time crunch service uh, personnel. So for the time, uh, so for this kind of situation, well, we can go. Uh, what about other uh, end of the spectrum, right? So what if we have this situation where we have the low recall now? So in the low recall setting, right, you can basically uh, miss out important requests that is a human service would have anticipated or would, would have liked to see, right? So that kind of design is also not good, right? Uh, so in low recall, low workload, that's totally ineffective because it's not going to help at all. Uh, the inefficient, if you have a high recall and basically high workload, then it's inefficient, right? Because you're not helping the workload um, for the human worker who is basically um, trying to you know, respond to the services. Uh, if you have a high workload and low recall, that's like a really worst kind of system scenario, right? Uh, and so therefore you may end up choosing then a system design which may have a high recall, but a low workload. But this is again like, you know, um, you can say it, it needs to be provided in the hands of the human user, right? And how do we do that, right? And if we don't have that kind of opportunity, can we still optimize to aim towards this kind of solution? So this is the kind of problem that we were interested in addressing uh, from a human-centered computing perspective, that you have the streaming uh, data requests that are coming in, right? And uh, for this uh, streaming request, you have a ranking mechanism, right? Like just we explained earlier that there can be serviceability-based ranking mechanisms, so on. So you rank, so these are critical messages at the top to all the way, um, like not so critical messages to respond at the bottom. And so based on that, you can actually construct a system performance metric. You know, you can actually find out 
potentially that if I have this different different settings of uh, how many requests that I give to the user and how many times does a user have to check those uh, messages to respond. So for example, these columns uh, are uh, representing like this PIJ over here. Uh, four time period that okay I need to check the system after every 10 minutes or I can check system after 20 minutes or I can check system after 30 minutes and so on and on your um, in this rows side you have these uh, selection of top key that how many messages basically that one uh, can basically see or check at a specific point of time so based on this kind of uh, different configuration settings for system, uh, we can actually also provide in this metrics uh, over here, performance metrics over here, uh, what are potentially attainable uh, recall in the workload so that we could figure out what is the potentially, uh, you know, uh, good system uh, design at a specific point of time, right, for a given user. So user can then, you know, choose the configuration as uh, he or she desires. So this was our overarching like, approach in terms of uh, creating a solution that would be more driven by human needs and driven by uh, more a desire for what kind of uh, you know, context that user is in and what user is basically is a capable of doing and is interested in doing, right? Like, because if user is already uh, too busy, it may not have sufficient bandwidth to look at, like, uh, if you give, uh, um, you know, 100 messages to look at for the user, right? So that that's basically the idea behind uh, this type of approach. So the summary of this approach is that first, you are going to uh, categorize and rank the messages. Second, you're going to construct those performance metrics and we call it your ranking workload metrics. You generate that. And then based on that, you can employ optimization algorithm on top of it, right? So either you can let a human user, uh, you know, make the uh, specific choice on the system design from, from that uh, ranking workload metrics, or we can automatically also um, use a sort of non-dominated sorting, uh, like uh, selection for the user. So, um, to model the serviceability, this is a, a, a the work that we did separately to just figure out how do you capture the serviceability characteristics of the social media request that comes to these kind of uh, emergency services. And we relied on this domain uh, knowledge that was there um, for their training curriculums to find out that what constitutes a good serviceable uh, you know, request that a service person would like to respond and uh, or would like to respond uh, as a priority. So based on that, uh, we found out these four characteristics that can be a uh, basically variable for this function of what can be serviceable. So first was this explicit request that when a, a user asks in his uh, social media request for help for a specific resource or sort of service, right? Um, second is like, if there is a question that can be kind of answered, Third is where there's a contextual information provided as much as possible so that they clearly, uh, a, the, the context could be understood for response. And lastly, like the message is also sent to the right organization. If you were seeking help for basically um, the non security related problems, then you might want to, you know, send a message not to police, but maybe uh, another agency's uh, service account. So these kinds of like uh, characteristics led us to uh, a design of approach where we first um, uh, collected using Likert scale functions, uh, different ratings for the messages. And here are some examples of the messages. These are average scores of Likert ratings that we got with the help of crowdsourcing workers for different messages. So for example, you can see the messages at the top, which are in green. You can see very specific information seeking uh, you know, context of those messages versus if you look at messages at the bottom, well, they are just talking about something you know, which is not technically important. It's, it's not operationally very important uh, for the uh, service. Uh, so in this kind of approach, then we uh, use also some ground truth uh, uh, data as a gold standard data for serviceability uh, with the help of uh, emergency management professionals. And basically using that, we developed a supervised learning to rank system that you can consider for um, a specific event. So we had about six events for which we had these type of uh, request data. 
and we had also their serviceability scoring labels and we also had these kind of serviceability model based characteristics ratings and all so using which we develop basically a learning to rank model once i have a learning to rank model i can of course employ it for future disasters where new new uh, you know streams of data comes in and you know you have a ranking predictor which is basically able to give the ranking scores so using this kind of uh, system, then you hear just examples of messages which are uh, which result from this kind of modeling uh, that uh, I just described using learning to rank um, based model. So uh, you have uh, this, you know, top messages. If you see in the greens, they are basically the very specific and like you know appropriate for seeking help and so on. While the red ones are not, and uh, you know for different different disasters like Hurricane Sandy versus um, Alberta, um, so floods. So Basically, you you have now a ranking mechanism, right? So you have a streaming uh, set, uh, you know, data with a lot of these um, requests from public, and you have a ranking mechanism. And once you have the ranking mechanism, uh, using this whole learning to rank approach, you, we can actually create this kind of ranking workload metric uh, that that we uh, uh, just uh, discussed a um, couple of slides uh, before uh, this slide. And then basically from here, we can uh, choose a configuration for the user uh, where if user is not, we didn't have a user available and we tried to do it in a simulated setting. So we just employed a Pareto optimization approach. And Pareto optimization approach is basically where you do not give preference. You do not make any of your uh, basically specific measure more dominated, right? And it tries to give you non-dominated sorting. So we try to use a Pareto frontier to select the kind of you know, potential system configurations which would be appropriate and they will be kind of non-dominated. So uh, to construct these kind of metrics on which you employ this Pareto optimization algorithm, um, we basically constructed this whole, we try to create a general framework here again to see that um, in this specific work, we only explored with machine performance metric of like recall. But you could, of course, go beyond that and you could have NDCG, pre-precision, and so on and so forth. And then we had a second component that is human performance metric. Uh, and the human performance metric here is like cognitive load that we were interest in, interested in that how many basically requests, uh, what is the hourly rate of request uh, for a user to read uh, and, and you look through. Uh, and you can, of course, extend it further uh, to you know, time on task and you know, other metrics which are possible. So using you know, this kind of mechanism of machine performance metric, metric and human performance metric, you can actually get a model that will allow you to construct this kind of uh, you know, performance metric for potential system configurations and based on which you can use the Pareto optimization. Right? And you basically uh, make a recommendation which, uh, for the system configuration, which is on the Pareto optimization, right? the, sorry, this Pareto frontier uh, that you have. So, uh, based on this, then we basically did uh, experiments where we looked at data from like uh, different different disasters uh, in the past, and based on those basically different disasters and the data we had for serviceability for them uh, from the earlier work that I described to you for serviceability uh, modeling, we were able to uh, create this kind of a system where we were interested in then exploring uh, that what is the uh, effect of this kind of recommendation of ranking workload policies using our approach versus a approach which will be basically a baseline approach. So we created basically two algorithms. Uh, one was like the periodic algorithm that you process this request that are coming in your stream in the past 24 hours. Um, and then you generate the top K ranking and then you generate this uh, ranking workload metrics and basically uh, at the start of every hour and you use that as a potential you know uh, system configuration for that uh, next start the second algorithm that we explored was this near real time algorithm and this was like basically we can say which was close to uh, you know in a realistic setting that you process the request um, from the last uh, one hour uh, as a sliding window. And then you have basically, uh, you know, this uh, generation of the stop care ranking, right? At, uh, uh, and the, of course, your ranking workload metrics at the beginning of every minute. So it's more like a uh, 
exploration of this real time setup right and based on this comparisons um, when we did the analysis so this was just the result of the data just to demonstrate that what happens is what we why do we need this kind of optimization for um, from humans perspective right human users perspective of this system so in this if you look at like uh, just for one disaster let's say sandy uh, what you have is on x axis this workload the different potential workloads settings that um, user would have to deal with and on the y axis potential recall values that you can get so what you see here is that at a specific workload value you can have a system configurations which basically result into different different recall values right and that is why you need this type of optimization approach which basically is able to factor in the human factor side, like your human performance metric, right? And basically the uh, machine performance metric side, right? And uh, that is basically the recall. And that that was our motivation, like as, as uh, when we started the study. So this is just like as an evidence, um, uh, you know, of the result uh, from our experimental setup as well. Uh, and so again, like back to the comparison of those algorithms that I was describing. So we created a greedy base, a greedy recall baseline uh, comparison when we did with our uh, approach. Then what we observed was that if you see the, um, the result here, uh, what it basically shows is that on the, uh, the um, x-axis you have time, like in one hour increments, and you have on y-axis this workload values. So what it demonstrates is that if you go with a basically uh, this, uh, su this suggestion that we have for this periodic RW recommendations that basically um, is informed by the whole Pareto optimization approach uh, that uh, uh, we advocate or we hypothesize would be better. Uh, you can see that you know in the this kind of setting, in, uh, if you look at it, the the workload actually for this type of algorithm, or, or you can say suggested by this type of uh, algorithm system configurations for a user, it is actually lesser. The workload recommendation is lesser as compared to if you would have chosen a approach, a greedy approach, which basically at every point of time picks uh, the uh, system configuration that is like greedy about the recall. They just want to have the best recall, right? And you can see that across different different events for, um, you know, this four different events, we observed this kind of pattern. And, uh, you know, this kind of demonstrates, uh, again, the significance of why do we need to uh, optimize for this uh, human side as well, uh, when we are looking at the system configuration. We also experimented uh, basically the setting where we try to look at um, the, again, like our approach comparison with the other setting. That is what if the um, a, a baseline algorithm chooses basically a policy that always pick a system configuration that gives minimum workload for the human user. So that is also not optimal. And that's what we again demonstrated with these experiments that you, you can choose rather a kind of approach that we suggest which factors into both um, the human side and the machine side. So this was kind of like this results were encouraging. And of course, we want to do more work towards, um, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, these lines of work uh, to factor in more, uh, you know, human, uh, different, different human factors, uh, measures to bring into this kind of approach and experiment more and all. So in conclusion, uh, I described you a human AI collaboration approach uh, that can help in uh, basically the scalable streaming data processing for like, you know, effectively supporting this emergency uh, personnel at this emergency services uh, by combining. So our basically main um, idea that we are really passionate about is that we combine this human factors with this AI systems, right? And uh, looking at going deeper into understanding what are the potential challenges for the human factor side and what are the challenges for the AI systems design side, we can, uh, we believe that we can create more effective and better systems for uh, our future of the city services. So with that, uh, I'm these, well, I, I just want to then summarize quickly lessons. So uh, for serviceability characteristics, right, uh, that I described you for capturing relevance of this request for help. Well, they, there are potential, uh, you know, benefits into the kind of uh, serviceability model that we presented, um, where we were informed by this domain knowledge for, for this, uh, uh, you know, service personnel. The second thing was uh, that uh, we saw evidence of using this kind of uh, 
serviceability ranking approach that is aware of this kind of workload constraints of the users as a better um, you know, approach rather than a greedy approach of a system design, which just kind of makes the user uh, you know, go towards just a greedy uh, you know, direction that choose a minimum workload approach or you know, maximum work uh, recall systems. So that's also not fair. Uh, and so based on this kind of limit, uh, basic lessons, um, we in this work, we also had some limitations that uh, the serviceability model that uh, so far we have studied is for non-English language. And yeah, of course, we want to explore for other languages at all, uh, also in the future. And we also want to explore for other platforms. So here we were uh, centered around Twitter, but uh, of course, in the future, we would like to explore for other platforms as well, where uh, these services would be generally uh, open to collect uh, requests for help from people. Um, and we, yeah, we only included uh, directly addressed requests to people and not like indirectly addressed requests. And, you know, we can also study that kind of uh, uh, requests in the future. For human AI collaboration perspective, yes, we want to extend the human performance metrics and the ranking workload metrics. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, this is just a um, beginning of a direction that we want to pursue more and more, where we are interested in studying different, different types of human factors and try to bring them into this kind of uh, uh, synergistic model between uh, human workers and then your AI systems in different different application settings and not just the emergencies, uh, emergency services. The second thing here, yeah, we want to also incorporate biases in the performance metric and yeah, eventually that could be helpful as well where we have a systematic data biases uh, that are being factored in. And yeah, we want to, of course, employ this kind of approach for other domains as well. So applications of this kind of work uh, we have been doing, we have the system citizen helper adaptive tool. And uh, in the system, we have a uh, transfer and active learning uh, setups where uh, we have a mechanisms to take expert user feedback uh, as the data comes in and you know your current model um, predicts and you know you want to take feedback from the experts or users to evolve the model over time, right? And so this tool uh, basically can have values for crowdsourcing work where we can better study the types of human errors that could occur in crowdsourcing work and then basically employ that for different different types of uh, applications of crowd work and one example was um, basically working with the search that we have done over the last year um, where uh, we help them with citizen helper to uh, do data annotation and rapid social media filtering for COVID-19 response. So uh, the citizen helper is resulted from my NSF CRA um, grant from NSF. And uh, yeah, in this basically, um, we wanted to just filter data uh, like as just the settings that I described earlier. And yeah, there, there are more uh, uh, fine grained uh, you know, research that can be an analysis that can be done um, in this kind of initiatives that uh, what I described to you earlier. So we are exploring in this direction uh, further. So in future, where do we go from here? So human aid collaboration that I described to you for the problems for the setting of uh, uh, this uh, filtering or this relevancy classification, active learning models, right? We can basically go beyond that. We can employ all those research of human annotation errors in these settings where various applications of service services are dependent on uh, like these models, which need to be very efficient, right? But to design those models, they, um, they need to collect a lot of labor data. And if they want to rely upon crowd work, well, again, our work can uh, basically help for that phase. Then for filtering applications or prioritization, as I described you, uh, but lastly, also very important, the human machine interaction part where you have this uh, uh, systems which are being supported by this uh, models which are adaptive in nature. Right. So across all of these phases, um, when you process the streaming data for different types of city services, right, you know, to augment workers' capability for processing information, well, uh, we see opportunity for fundamental research um, as in, at the intersection of AI and human-centered computing. So with that, I will end here. And this is my lab's link. And I want to acknowledge my collaborators in this specific work, um, Chato, 
Imran and Val, Val as well. Uh, she has been working, helping us now for modeling psychological processes. So uh, yeah, I want to acknowledge her contribution as well. And um, US uh, DHS Science and Technologies, uh, the social media working group, uh, where we had this researcher practitioner subgroup, um, uh, you know, co-led with me by Steve Peterson. So I thank him as well. And uh, my labs of students and NSF, a particular uh, set of grants which supported this line of work. So that's it from my side. I open uh, the question um, for you guys. Questions, students? While they think about it. Um, so uh, is there any application, um, and I'm kind of really stretching this, Mm -hmm. uh, to engaging humans uh, via virtual assistant or chatbots, uh, um, you know, I mean, because uh, while humans initiate communication with chatbots asking for information or questions, um, uh, if uh, it's going to be, if these virtual agents are going to be um, um, good partners for humans, they will have to also initiate um, Questions. They also also uh, actively seek information from humans, mm -hmm. uh, or from other humans on behalf of uh, one. So um, that's right. Uh, for mm -hmm. a virtual agent serving a, a minor, uh, maybe it might want to ask uh, the parent about some question if there is such a thing. Uh, so in that context, is there any um, eventual future? application of uh, what you work on in terms of when to ask a question, what to ask the question, how to engage human and when? Mm -hmm. So yes, Dr. Uh, it, it can be. So if we think about, let's say, streams of uh, uh, prompts that virtual assistant give to a human actor. So the prompts that you, uh, the, uh, the virtual assistant give to the human actor, how does he figure out what should be the sequence of those prompts should be uh, to collect the best possible, uh, let's say, information that the chatbot is interested in collecting, right? Let's say if it is uh, interested in collecting like uh, the example scenario we had worked for that uh, humanity inspired paper that uh, the medical assistant, right, for seniors. So in that case, the chatbot is interested in collecting information about the state of the, let's say, human user. And in that case, if he is interested in better understanding the human state, it might be asking certain questions to get a sense whether it wants to recommend the uh, specific medication or not at that point of time. So it's trying to collect more situation awareness or contextual information from the human user. So what, what is it that it will ask the user A and then how basically it will ask the question that you uh, said could be informed by certain sequence of actions, right? It doesn't want to ask maybe uh, often as we say that uh, one doesn't want to ask direct question. One is going like indirect route to get to uh, answer of a direct question. So there would be a role of sequence there that potentially. So that kind of like a sequencing or ordering effect of which questions are asked, such as to maximize the information collection without without creating any burden on the human actors. So I think the non-invasive approach of the bot to interact with the human can include this kind of sequencing mechanism, the role of sequencing mechanisms as well. Mm. Now, uh, are you, you, you're probably aware of our work on um, personalized health, personalized knowledge graphs, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what is, what is a possible role in your model to incorporate that kind of memory of what has been communicated with the pay, you know with the, with the human user and uh, uh, okay. incorporating uh, some sort of analysis of past interaction while engaging and prioritizing what to how to engage human so to create one possibility is when we model the human error, we are trying to model <coughs> human error using some function, mathematical functions, right? But how they can be informed, better informed by what is the um, good mental model of the human is really, right? Because PKGs can kind of capture that nuance for 
the human actor. And I see that's where I see the value that uh, one is trying to uh, guess that human will make the errors, right? Based on just this limited context of what the sequence of information that we are uh, uh, showing to the user. But in the this particular system and the work that I described does not take anything externally that might be available to the human actor, right? And that's where I see, I think that the PKGs can play a role if we have uh, uh, scenarios where we have construction of those PKGs for human annotator, uh, actors and annotators, yeah. Okay. Um... So the class, you guys have any, anybody has a question? Hemant, I have a one question regarding uh, the role of explainable AI for this kind of applications. Mm -hmm. So we know that the machine learning and deep learning going to kind of helping the user to uh, bring more transparency. So do you see sir, that this particular domain, do you see the role of explainable AI in this role or it will be overkilling to this domain? So I would just like to know your perspectives, the role of explainable AI in this particular, specific this kind of applications domain. Right. So Pankesh, yes, there is a value of explainable AI, right? In terms of better informing the human annotator about the mental state or you, like we are using this metaphor of the model, machine model, right? How does, um, how can we make better understand what current mental models are as a metaphor? of the AI side is to the human user, right? And therefore, when the human is giving feedbacks and all, right, human can kind of uh, uh, better rectify the errors in the machine's already learned model, the patterns that machine has already learned, you know? So that way, you know, model would be better trained. Like eventually the, what's the ultimate goal would be is that you have a better model eventually, which is not just, uh, you can say black box per se, finding patterns on its own and all, but being a little bit more sensible in finding the kinds of patterns, which also matters to the humans or where, where human has also sort of validated that, yeah, these are good patterns, right? Otherwise, the machine learning model is this pattern library, which is just a black box to the annotator, the, the human worker, really. So I right. see it there. Correct, yeah. correct. And even I see that the role of knowledge graph also in this kind of application where you provide more information, not only provide more information uh, um, about the model, but what right. extra information you could uh, provide to the uh, to the user through knowledge graph exactly so which can enrich the information further and take a helping the user in a decision making absolutely you're absolutely right so this that's exactly the kind of place where um, uh, you know it could help like in in modeling the state of human right and rather than assuming that human will make errors because just this limited data context uh, the you know what the system has access to in understanding about human right and this external knowledge base uh, if we have access to it could certainly help Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Edmund. Mm -hmm. I think Kaushik has a question here. How does Pareto optimization help in under specification of a priori a user preferences? I think hmm. he also says that that answers the question. So I think he got that. Okay, all right. have your slides and answer that question. So okay. Okay. Uh, hi, Professor. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so about your uh, about the first problem that you introduced uh, to reduce annotators' errors, mm -hmm. uh, you said the uh, order is very important uh, for the annotators. Uh, but from my own uh, ex uh, experience, uh, actually I uh, um, do some research in computer vision, and uh, I know a task is called uh, like instance segmentation. So uh, there, I think the distance between the classes is also important, uh, like for uh, for the annotator, such as for the vehicle class. Maybe uh, some class are very, are very similar, uh, like car and truck or motor, uh, uh, bicycle, uh, motors uh, or bicycle. I think the, uh, the the features from the classes are also very similar and maybe lead to annotators. Uh, they might uh, have the arrows during the annotation. What do you think of this? Is this another like 
maybe a uh, important okay. factor. Yes. Right. Very good question and very good observation. Yes, answer is yes, it will. Uh, because you you can find so the this is like a, so we have uh, presented here like sort of first solution we try to find out this was our first problem of identification as well so that's the kind of like research we are interested in finding like those first kind of problems so um, certainly we would like to extrapolate it further uh, as in with your observation and our observation is absolutely spot on that there will be this classes there will be this uh, you can see and this is where I think. A value of like a knowledge model of these classes can also be meaningful. That if we have a, what if we had a knowledge model of these classes about some having relationships to each other, some are actually close to each other. Yes. Like the examples you mentioned, and there is a hierarchy among them, right? Like a cars versus trucks, which have a hierarchy of a super class that is about vehicles. And so that informs, of course, um, and, and that can inform the human annotators as well as we can say that it could help them annotate uh, better for those classes and maybe they don't make errors for those types of classes. Um, and in, in this example that uh, um, that uh, I presented to you guys, the C1, C2, C3, C4, these were like very distinct orthogonal kind of classes. But certainly you can see that if there are not this much contrast uh, in the kind of example you gave, well, there could be like a value in rather having the instances of the similar classes together because it helps the user to annotate them well. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Very good observation, yeah. Um, I see a lot of hands. I don't know if you guys uh, had a questions, but um, yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. You're, you're muted. Yeah, the hands are for students who are officially registered for the class, and then there see. are uh, observers or, or uh, edit, uh, auditing the courses. Okay. Uh, okay. So that is the difference. Okay. okay. All right. Well, I think uh, this has been wonderful. We have used up our time, and uh, thank you very much, um, Hemant. Uh, and um, I, uh, looks like uh, st uh, students uh, enjoyed it. All right, guys, uh, we also have um, uh, another uh, talk next week, and I have already posted um, information on that on our LinkedIn group. And we'll post this video soon in our, uh, again, gr uh, group. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Shetan. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, have a wonderful everybody. weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Um, and uh, you may want to... Punkesh uh, 